extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube. Covering VMworld 2015. Brought to you by VMware and its ecosystem sponsors. And now your host, John Furrier. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are live in San Francisco, Moscone North for VMworld 2015. This is Silicon Angles, The Cube, our flagship program, where we go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier. We're here in the director set. We got two sets going on, live broadcasting, acquiring all that data, sharing that with you. Our next guest is famous venture capitalist, Jerry Chen, did the Docker investment, was the first to see the mega trend of containers, uh, former VMware um, employee, cloud guy, technologist, Welcome back to the Cube. Cube, Cube regular. Cube is, alumni. Is, yeah. We have a Hall of Fame. You're on the ballot first year, yeah, a ballot Hall of Famer on the hey, Cube. I'm not alumni. retired yet, so but thank you. <laughs> Welcome back. Thanks. So we always like to kid you. Your, your first investment was Docker. Yep. And, you know, does he have the sophomore jinx? Was my kind of you know poking fun at you. Thanks. Um, congratulations again on all the success. We love Docker. Ben and the team, phenomenal, great, great people, doing great stuff. Yep. And not being too you know, aggressive on the business model yet. I get yeah. that, no problem. The growth is continuing to flower up. So um, give us an update on the Docker and this impact. And, sure. And, and talk, get some color on how much of this success you saw and didn't see. <laughs> uh, what was, what was, what was uh, what's, what's the outcome now in your mind of how looking back and where you are now? Uh, well, let's, let's separate. There's the company, there's the technology, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit of both. And I think like all technology trends, um, it takes a while to create an impact, but when it tips, it, it changed the industry. And like you said, I was at VMware for almost a decade and saw how that was growing, 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 and then became this huge standard that kind of shifted the entire industry. And I think we're seeing now at Docker the same kind of trend and influence on technology, but five times faster than the ramp up that VMware had. So the exciting thing is, is Docker's really a pioneering a new way to think about applications and application deployment. So just like VMware rethought about infrastructure, storage, networking, Docker is now saying, okay, what's the right unit for the cloud? What's the right kind of atomic unit? It's really changed how you think about building applications. So talk about the, what this has enabled, because yeah. one of the things that we, I think, you know, on theCUBE and Wikibon, we look at this all the time, and we're trying to kind of, you know, read the tea leaves and also put it, the story together. It seems that Docker has done more than that. It seems that Docker has yeah. enabled the revolution of what I call modern day, app workflow, whatever, sure. I don't even have a name yeah. for it, but yeah. back in the mini computer days, you saw SAP, yeah. you saw Oracle, big ERP rollouts. Yeah. It powered an ecosystem of consultants and projects and essentially workflow. Yep. So now with developers, we're seeing a real monetization happening at the application level under the hope that the infrastructure is invisible, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, look at OpenStack, fumbling its way through, sure, sure. you know, so how hard it is to deploy infrastructure, yet the app pressure to build is still hot. Correct. Well, look, two things. At the highest level, um, cloud and mobile changes everything because that's forcing you to build new apps, right? But then you think, okay, you need to build new cloud and mobile apps. What's the best way to do that? And Docker's really enabling this um, ability to build new applications faster. And when I think about entrepreneurship around Docker, there's really two questions you need to ask. Is A, when you move to Docker, move to containers, what breaks, what changes. And so there's a whole ecosystem trying to fix the old to work in the Docker ecosystem. But more exciting is when you move to Docker, when you move to containers, what can you now do differently or better? So how does security work better in Docker? How does networking work better in Docker? How does app deployment work better in Docker? Or you can say like, oh, what breaks? What around storage breaks around Docker? What around compliance breaks with Docker? And so if you think about those two angles, what changes or what can you do differently and as an entrepreneur, it's an exciting time because you kind of pick and choose um, yeah. how you want to play, and there's plenty of companies to be created. And the, and the, and the growth in the market on the deployment side is there, as I mentioned. Correct. So let's talk about what, what breaks and what kind of uh, changes. Um, hybrid cloud, big buzzword, but really cloud native is probably taking the place of sure. Docker and Kubernetes is probably the most overused buzzword. What the hell does cloud native mean? Sure. One. And then, but if let's if talk you're about born that. in Canada, are you cloud native? <laughs> cloud native is a great term, but let's talk about cloud native. So you have the, hype, the web scale guys. Yeah. You know, Yahoo, Google, yeah. Facebook. These guys have been living DevOps from day one. Yeah. And then you have the emerging startups, Box, Dropbox, you name those companies, Netflix. Yeah. They're cloud native because they're born in the cloud. Yeah. Then you got everybody else. Yeah. That legacy. 
How do you guys see that evolving? And when you guys have that board, the board meeting in Docker, because you have people who want to go faster, but have that legacy, they don't have that clean yeah. sheet of paper. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's such an interesting thing to say cloud native, because we're, we're dealing with a generation of um, college grads and engineers and developers and companies that, like you started born in the cloud, they've never been inside a data center, they've never racked a server or set up a SAN. <laughs> and when you think about what changes, if they, they don't even know what a physical switch is, that's cloud native. And when you kind of put yourself in those shoes, that's a huge paradigm shift. So now you're looking at your, your I don't know, what's right now is an immigrant to the cloud, right? You're looking for <laughs> the passport to the cloud and your, your, your ticket. But um, you probably don't want to be, a, uh, unless you want to move to the cloud, that's one option, and you want to go from on-premise, completely cloud, or this concept of like this hybrid cloud, and I think a lot of noise is lost in that word hybrid, because yeah. it implies that you want to move apps back and forth, or some workload spread, and I think what we're seeing with most enterprise is, there's a category of applications that'll probably never go to the cloud, that's fine, but there's a category of applications they're building that are cloud native. They're built first for the cloud, on the cloud. And mistake one was trying to build new apps with old tools, right? That was, that was a fail. And what happened, Docker and these new technologies came around like MongoDB, new storage, new databases, like Redis, for cloud native apps. Second paradigm is, okay, I built new stuff in the cloud with new technologies, that's the right answer. Right, the fail was old technologies. Yeah. Number two, it's got an existing app, I want to move to cloud, what do I do? Do I rebuild it, right, from scratch? And, and you know, there's advantages to doing that, and sometimes some apps you should rebuild. Um, do you wrap it up in a VM or a container, kind of just lift and shift it to the cloud, be a public cloud or private cloud? And then the third is, what category applications probably don't go in the cloud right now or shouldn't in the near future, and how do I leave it on-premise, secure it, give me some of the agility and some of the goodness I get around the cloud, but with my, my legacy technology. What do you think about hybrid cloud? What's your take on that? I mean, I, we, I asked every guest this past week, sure. since OpenStack and, and LinuxCon last week or two weeks ago, what's, what, does hybrid cloud exist? Is it an outcome, is it a product? I mean, you can't really buy hybrid cloud. I mean, the, what does it look like? Is it the tooling? What is? I, I, you know, you don't get the right answer, you don't ask the right question. And I think <laughs> the right question is, you know, what is the right definition of hybrid cloud? And, and if you ask um, any of your guests, or any 10 folks attending here, you'll probably get 12 different answers of yeah, what hybrid true. cloud is. And I, I think hybrid cloud is kind of what you want the cloud to be. And that's not a wrong answer, right? Because yeah. in many ways, it's like, um, why should any single vendor or company impose, this is what cloud is, this is what hybrid cloud is on you? Why don't you as an engineer, you as a developer, say, you know what, this is how I define hybrid cloud, this is my cloud, and it, it, for some it's public-private, some it's like a, my own cloud but it's hosted in a rack space, some it's a single application spanning multiple clouds. Me, my hybrid cloud is, is Azure and Google and Amazon. That's three public clouds, but it's my hybrid. And so, um, I think question one is, what do you define hybrid? And I think it's fine for everyone out there to define hybrid in a different way. Because it just shows you what we're really seeing, this, this um, you know, Cambrian explosion of, of new ways to think about apps and architecture, and that's a good thing. Well, I think the key word in that, first of all, great, great summary, I love, I love that answer. Engineering is the answer. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's an engineering Decision. opportunity yeah. to say, hey, our business has unique requirements, and this is how our infrastructure is going to look. It's kind of like distributed computing. Yep. It's a concept, but how it's deployed in engineers is different by the yep. environment of the apps and the, and the, and the business. So like, what, different horses <laughs> for courses, right? As they like to say, different, different types of hybrid cloud for yeah. different apps. And, and I think what you're seeing, there's a generation of new technologies out there, like Docker, um, that are enabling you to build the cloud you want. And, um, that's probably a more profound question of, of what does that look like? And you know, you can talk to the VMware folks or the Docker folks or the OpenStack folks, the Red Hat folks, and they probably all have a different opinion. But I, I get excited because I, I go to engineering meetups all the time, I talk to them how they build their apps, and even out in Silicon Valley between you know, Facebook, Google, Medium, Twitter, the, the way they build their apps and their clouds are slightly different too. Yeah, yeah. It's agile, it's defined by the personnel, yep. the environment, great answer. Oh, I got to ask you about, um, I was on, I'm emceeing a, a launch last night company, and we are talking about the, the cartel of storage, EMC, <laughs> um, you, I know you guys are investors in Pure, yep. um, but we were speculating, when was the last breakout storage company since yeah. NetApp? Yeah. Pure now is looking good off the tee, as they say. Um, still, 
incrementalism has always been their answer, but what's game changing yeah. in storage? You got networking with NSX, throwing some numbers around, like it's pretty impressive, looks pretty good, sounds good, but again, that's VMware articulating it. But what are you seeing happening that's organically coming out of the market? Not vendor defined, sure, unified sure. and sure. software defined are vendor terms. Sure. Yeah. Hyperconverged was not a vendor term, that Correct. was a kind of came out of the engineering community. So what are you seeing now that's bubbling up that's not a vendor driven yeah. key trend? Okay, I think it's storage, there's probably three things to track. One is um, the storage medium, disk versus flash, um, and it's server side flash, array flash, um, uh, storage class memory. So you, there's a whole bunch of interesting stuff coming from Intel around storage class memory. So one is to think about the medium. Number two is the architecture, hyperconverged, array, server side, cloud base, et cetera, right? So I think that's, a th that's the second thing to think about. The third thing is, is kind of location. Is it private cloud, appliances? Is it software only? Is it like a hosted service, right, only in the cloud? And so you think about those three axes, like kind of pick and choose, you're seeing a bunch of companies either go deep on one of those three things, we're going to be pure, the flash storage company. Doesn't matter where the flash is, we're making a bet on that wave is going to swamp EMC and the rest. You have folks that kind of make a bet around, okay, next gen um, server side, or next gen array base. And you have a whole generation of companies saying, we're going to be the storage service in the cloud, or storage service on premise, or storage for, for um, solid fire. So I would say, if you look at those three trends, you're going to find some, some good innovation in each of those. Some, some incremental stuff, yeah, yeah. but also some good innovation yeah, and, and the way you just laid it out was awesome, because it, it's complicated. It's not, it's not, you can't just say, I'm betting on that horse. There's a lot of courses and different horses. So right. <laughs> yeah. we don't know what the weather's going to be like, depending S upon the Stor course. Storage is a $40 billion industry, yeah. and, um, it, and it looks it's Waiting to be disrupted. It is was, I would argue it's, it's always disrupted, right? Because you look, you got pure storage and kind of Nutanix disrupting this yep. generation. Before that, you had, you had NetApp, you had Icelon, you had Data Domain, another Greylock investment. So uh, we've been lucky to be involved with a couple of these generations from Data Domain to Pure and um, hopefully beyond, but we continually see yeah. storage going through these, these generational cycles. Yeah, I mean, but to me, that when, the, when the names change on the leaderboard, I mean, Data Domain, I know is a great exit, still is an R&D project for EMC, ultimately a two billion sure. plus uh, R&D project, but you know, great, great product. But there's a lot of efficiency still available in, yeah. as, as, you, as you lay out the different cloud opportunities per, per company, there's a ton of opportunities. So with that, I want to ask you um, the sophomore jinx question. <laughs> sure. So what else have you invested in? Yeah. What, what, uh, what are you working on? What do you get your eye on? Um, share. Tease out. I don't, know, I don't want you to give away your trade secrets to the other VCs, um, <laughs> but what are you looking at um, right now? What have you just I, recently invested post Docker? Because Docker was your first investment. I don't know if there's any trade secrets to give. Uh, <laughs> I, I think there's. They got uh, you on surveillance. Where's Sherry Chen going? <laughs> It's really, there's, there's really not much to follow or surveil. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm lucky to be involved with uh, three other companies, four other companies right now. Uh, a security company that we incubated, uh, Michael Callahan, who you know really well. Mm -hmm. So that, yep. uh, as you heard today in the keynote, security is going to be an evergreen market, yep. so we're excited. Uh, enterprise app company that my partner Joseph and I incubated, so it's still early, but it's attacking kind of um, enterprise applications. I'm an observer on Cloudera, so I spend a lot of time in the big data space. When did that happen, recently? Uh, so I've been kind of evolved uh, loosely for the past year, two years okay. almost, because I spent a lot of time. And Neil's been pretty busy. And Neil's, well, Neil's a full-time board member, he's a great board member, but I've been looking at a bunch of these next-gen data companies, and I've been helping the Cloudera folks out think through uh, different things I'm seeing as an investor. And so uh, me and uh, Pete Sonsini, we just announced a small seed investment we did yesterday in a company called uh, Instabase, so the V Mafia working together. Wow. Yeah. How come we didn't get that on the cube? What's <laughs> happening? Well, you had Pete earlier, right? I know. I would have had that on. We had a special segment. Come exactly. on. All right, Pete, you're watching. We're going to come back and follow up on that. So to explain that, small. How big was the deal? Small seed was it a seed uh, deal? It was less than four million dollars. So, right, so like a, like large seed, small A. Um, and so Pete and I have been looking for a project to work on together. It's uh, a great entrepreneur, uh, a not Bardwaj. He's a uh, Stanford grad, CS master's, uh, PhD student at MIT in their C cell lab, and he created a, a project called Data Hub when he was at uh, MIT, and now he's taking some of the learnings around his project and his PhD thesis and creating a company around it. So, All right. a lot so of you're on it, So you got four other projects besides Docker, and, and I've been looking lately around. Um, vertical SaaS applications. So looking at, if you saw the keynote today from construction to healthcare to finance to government, each of these verticals are going to be rethinking 
applications for those industries. So I've been spending a lot of time looking at different workflows and different different these verticals, and you'll see some um, projects coming out of that space for me too. What's the biggest surprise you had in, at a board meeting with Docker, Ben and the team? Obviously, a great, uh, great theme over there. Um, just feedback from the market, some anecdotal comment, <laughs> besides just the massive traction that they've had. What well, well, specific new are, learning board can Board meetings you... are confidential. But well, uh, anecdotally trend data. I mean, what, I mean I'm looking for yeah, something yeah. that can, you can share that's unique, that just, that's a unique learning that you've acquired. I, I say the unique learning here, and, and what Docker does well is focus, right? It's um, people who want Docker to be another VMware and just recreate all everything VMware did is, are probably not thinking about Docker right. Docker's enabling a whole new way of building applications, and if you kind of embrace Docker as a new architecture, that's the right way to think about cloud-native applications. And I think the learning is, you know, I'm surprised, some of the companies out there who you think would be um, laggards are actually embracing stateless applications, containers of apps, you know, scale out versus scale up, um, you know, new database technology. So I would say the, the learning there is, pretty much most of the companies you would think are slow movers, um, the, the dis incumbents would be disrupted, are all having small projects of self-disruption. And I think if you're, if you're a savvy CEO and Osman right now, you're going to find those pockets and you'll, you'll follow it aggressively. Okay, final question. Um, what's going on right now in terms of the VMware ecosystem? Obviously you see the announcement of Microsoft with Windows yeah. 10 on stage with Sanjay Poon on end user computing. You got you know, vCloud <coughs> kind of out there. Vsphere and vCenter, a lot of cool stuff going on. Obviously, they made some good decisions and they were building out, but yeah. the world's still evolving. Their boat is a little heavy right now. They're picking up a lot, they're doing a lot, as Pete yeah. said. The, but there's a lot of turbulence in, in the water, if you will, in the VMware boat and the ecosystem. What are the investment opportunities that you see and opportunities for entrepreneur sure. uh, within the VMware ecosystem? Are, and are they doing it right? Is VMware making the right moves? What would you recommend yeah. that they look at or change, all that above. You know, I, I think, so VMware's a company I, I know well, I have a lot of um, affection for it in my, my heart, and I think they do some things well and some things not so great. And so I think some of the core technologies around uh, virtualization, that's their bread and butter, they're doing that great. I would say the opportunity around VMware is look at things that uh, they, don't, they don't do well or just not a priority, right? And so you'll, you'll see them making kind of announcements in different market spaces from um, clouds to mobile to security. And you're like, okay, that kind of makes sense, but if it's not a priority for the company, then they're probably not going to do it great. And you know, look at um, uh, networking security, I think is one they're probably doing some interesting stuff around. I think the question becomes, is that the right architecture for the next 20 years, or is that just kind of the architecture of the last 20 years warmed over, right? Are they leading or following, Correct. is what you're kind of and, saying. And the debate is, is this technology in each of their product categories um, the last of the prior generation or the first of the next generation? And if the last of the prior generation, you're like, fine, I'm going to build an ecosystem product to go forward. Yeah, to leap forward, use a springboard. If they're doing something that's the first of the next generation, then that's either get out of their way or ride on top of it. And so I'd say there's some products that are going is like last, last of the, the best of the last generation. And there's some efforts I think they're going to try to do first and the next. And with any incumbent is how many of these um, plays can they do and do really, really well with everything else going on. And not get defocused. Not get defocused. Not take too much on. Correct, and there, there's a lot of, I mean, and that's why you see some companies do things well and wrong. Like um, cloud as a service, right? It's, you can argue, um, you know, if you're not Amazon or Google or Microsoft that can do things at scale, you know, why should be in the, in, in the data center building business, right? <laughs> final question, final, final question. I always go with the final, final question here now because I always pop one in there. Dave Vellante and I were talking about um, Amazon. We always loved the Amazon. And we did a uh, panel prior to VMworld, me, Stu, Dave, and Brian Gracie, our new analyst basically trying to peg the inning of where the disruption is. And yeah. I'm like, man, you know, it's early. First inning, maybe they haven't even started. Spring training. And Dave's like, no, no, we're in the seventh inning. So huge different debate on yeah. where we are. And then Mark Lewis at Formation Data wrote a blog post. He obviously was inspired to write a uh, blog post that said, no guys, you got it all wrong. It's double header. <laughs> Game one is Amazon. <laughs> Game two is enterprise, different rules. So I, watch, I want to get your take on that comment because uh. you could argue the big players of this next generation are emerging Amazon. Yeah. Okay, game one, public cloud, clearly dominating. Yeah. Game two, getting started. Do you yeah. agree? And if you do, what's the rules of the new game well, in I, the enterprise? I'm trying to think of the right sport <laughs> metaphor. Yes, <laughs> innings, the double header. If you stick with baseball, 
I think it's both a doubleheader and early in the first game, okay? And because uh, two things. One, underlying all this change is, is the benefit of Moore's Law and scale, right? And so the cost to build a data center cloud at scale is going down by half every 18 months. So think about that, right? The cost to stand up an Amazon data center, run an Amazon cloud at scale four years ago was 2x the cost. And you know, they did the DOD deal before, and it was $500 million plus or minus. In three or four years, they could probably do that at 250 million, right? If the government or some other government or some other industry said, hey, we'll pay you $300 million, build us our own Amazon. So the cost for them to do that goes down as a unit of cloud, is an, an Amazon instance, if, if you can imagine, like a $500 billion instance. But it also lets new people come in and get to scale faster, because all of a sudden the, the barriers to entry become half and half and half. And so it's still early, because I think there's uh, uh, most of the enterprise apps and even consumer apps aren't on the cloud. God bless Amazon and Google and all those companies, but they're, they're not on Amazon, so it's early. But um, this is the game where the rules in the later inning change because the underlying benefits of Moore's Law and the technology around us, bandwidth, mobile, is enables um, uh, the later innings to play by almost a different rule book. In terms of rule. Jerry Chen here, sharing his insights, his observations, his learnings, and also what he's working on as a uh, general partner at Greylock. Um, partners, great, uh, great to see you Thanks, on theCUBE, great to uh, have you back. Congratulations on the sets. I, my, my favorite set still, I think, is VMworld Vegas when you were in the big hang space with, <laughs> the, with the huge screens. Yeah, that was so, a good one. That yeah. was fantastic. That was the first time we had Frank Slootman on, former data domain, uh, Brenda Greylocks as well, um, one of our favorite uh, CEOs out there. Great to see you. Thanks. Jerry Chen, investor perspective, former VMware technologist, here inside theCUBE on the director's set, the two-set production in uh, Moscone North, VMworld 2015. We'll be right back after this short break.